I prefer this one. Okay. Oh, it's visible. Yes. I think you have that. Yeah, you have the academic. The academic So we start with we also have this lecture start always to see the whole temple. This is where it's past the hour. So you have to say, yes, 15 minutes. So we lecture from 8 to 9, and then 9 to 20, then it's fine. So that's I was I was teaching I was I was I was I was Wow. We recently reintroduced that piece. I'm going to go to the 
Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to this uh, PhD colloquium. <coughs> the speaker today is Professor Carl Jacobs, whom I have now the, the pleasure and the honor to shortly introduce to you. Um, first of uh, all, one practical point there is a usual thing to paper with browser. And then uh, one more information. Which is making it interesting for you because today we will run an experiment. So, if you have questions during the talk, of course, Professor Jakobsen said you're invited to, to ask uh, what is not clear, whatever. But after the seminar, um, and the seminar will be over, there will be five, ten minutes for questions eventually, in case taken from the colleagues. Uh, and then all the faculty are invited to leave the room uh, and you PhD students will say alone uh, with Professor Jakobs. Uh, and this is something which they, are, they, are, they put in place in Freiburg uh, and it's working. So you probably will feel less shy to ask. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the seminar, we are all leaving the room. Okay. So, Yakal, thanks for being here. <laughs> it's a pleasure and a pleasure. Short interview to you. Uh, Professor Jacobs is a very well known uh, scientist from, uh, in the uh, high energy physics community. So, I have a long list of his uh, awards and his uh, um, leadership, leadership roles that he covered during this year. I will be very short, not to steal him too much time. 
So I started this research career in the UA2 experiment. Then he joined Aleph experiment at LEP. And uh, since 1992, he joined the Atlas experiment while doing in parallel uh, also an experiment, running an experiment uh, in the Tevatron Collider, so the D0 experiment. Uh, in Atlas, he was first uh, involved in the detector um, development, liquid iron calorimeter, construction of the part of the inner track. Uh, um, and then uh, he moved to physics, uh, where he had a long list of over a long list of leading positions. For instance, he was convener of the physics uh, working group uh, in 1997, uh, 2002. Then he was uh, deputy physics coordinator and finally physics coordinator of the other experiment in the years 2007, 2008. And then uh, from uh, he covered one mandate of spokesperson of the Atlas collaboration. So he was our, our leader of the full experiment from 2017 to 2021. And at the moment, uh, he's the chairperson of the European Committee for Future Accelerators. So it's just, it's really one of the few persons who is deciding the future of, the, of our field. In the meantime, he did something else, like uh, twice a mandate as director of the Institute of Physics Institute in Freiburg and many other interesting uh, things, uh, academic and administrative things. He has been awarded by the uh, with the Stern Medal in 2015 for the work uh, and is a significant significant contribution to the the discovery of the Higgs boson. So I want to see more time to his uh, seminar, Professor. Yeah, it's a really an honor to have him here. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and I give you the floor for your seminar. Thank you so much. Yeah, <clears throat> thank you very much, uh, Daniela. So it's also a pleasure for me to be here in Bavia, to be back. I was here a couple of years ago when there was, uh, there was an Atlas Italia meeting here. Uh, so it's my second visit to Bavia. I did not expect to get rain. <laughs> As a German, you don't expect to get rain in Italy, but I'm told it's a good thing. And I'm sure uh, that also um, Bavia is quite enjoyable and it's a pleasure to be here. Also, it is rain. There are many other things to discover. So, as uh, already mentioned, um, I I'm also dealing myself now with the future, and that's also why why the, the talk is given uh, as the Higgs boson. Here, I would like to give you a status: what have we learned over the past ten years since the discovery? Where do we stand? And what are the directions particle physics has to go uh, over the next decades? So let me just um, go back and recall a bit. Uh, the time of the discovery. It's a little more than now 11 years uh, ago. Uh, I'm sure everybody remembers, and um, I found it quite remarkable that even in the main news of the German TV, um, there was uh, an announcement about this Higgs boson discovery. Uh, you should know particle physics is not as popular in Germany as it is in Italy. So this is quite uh, a sensation that it made the headlines in the, in the main news. And as you all know, there was also the Nobel Prize awarded to Foswa on Lea and Peter Hicks exactly one year later. And also here it was clearly mentioned. Uh, this is, uh, of course, because of the confirmation by the experiments Atlas and CMS of their theory, which they formulated many, many years ago. So let me start very basic. <clears throat> How does the Higgs boson come into play in particle physics? And what are the predictions about its properties? So I'm sure you all have learned in the basic lectures about the standard model of particle physics, which is composed of constituents of matter. You see them here, which are the quarks and the leptons, which appear in three generations, which is, uh, as you know, still a mystery, why there are three generations. Uh, and they are spin one half particles, so fermions. And then we have the fundamental interactions, which I list here, the electromagnetic force, the strong force, and the weak force. And then there is, of course, uh, gravity. And in the present understanding of our theory, quantum field theory, these um, interactions are mediated by exchange or mediator particles, uh, which are uh, spin one gauge bosons, like the photon for the electromagnetic force, the gluons for the strong force, then you have the heavy W and Z bosons for the weak force and the graviton 
for the accreditation. So the problem comes into play that in theory, in order not to break the symmetries, um, you require that these gauge bosons are strictly massless. However, this is uh, at variance with the experiment where you observe also by the weakness of this force here, that the mediators of the weak force are very, very heavy. Yeah, 80.4 GeV, so really a sizable amount of, uh, of mass. And this, prop, this was a problem, and this was solved by adding a third pillar to the standard model, namely the so-called Higgs sector. And Peter Higgs and, um, and Onglea and Proud, they introduced a scalar field here, which is a spin zero, which then manifests itself by a spin zero Higgs boson. So as you may know, this uh, theory, this was introduced in 1964, and you see here the publications time, uh, time ordered. The uh, Belgium theories, Anglia and Broad were first. At that time, there was nearly no internet, so the troops did not know anything about each other. They're working on this, and more or less the same idea was published by Peter Hicks independently, and then also by a third group in the same year, which also tells you that maybe the time was right to make the next step and put this on paper. And um, it's also well known that the idea uh, is also first used in um, condensed matter theory and was then transported by these gentlemen uh, into particle physics. So uh, you add a scalar field with a, with a potential and the potential has this form here with two parameters, mu square and then a quadratic term and then a cubic term here with the parameter lambda. If you now choose, the, um, the signs of these parameters mu square and lambda appropriate, such that lambda is larger than zero, mu square is smaller than zero, you have an interesting phenomena that you get a potential which um, does not have the minimum at zero field strengths, but you go through a minimum here at a certain vacuum expectation value where you have a field strength present. Now, if, if both of these parameters would be larger than zero, this would be boring and you would have uh, nothing dramatic happens, but this is uh, what is considered to be uh, linked to the spontaneous symmetry breaking, namely that the vacuum is not uh, at the point of zero field strengths. You have a vacuum somewhere, somewhere at a different place. So in other words, you have a vacuum expectation value. You can work out that this value is 246 GeV. This you can work out by the uh, uh, basically uh, cut from uh, the Fermi interaction, from the interaction strengths of the weak, weak interaction. And then linked to this, um, if you introduce such a field is of course the manifestation of the field, namely the Higgs boson. Um, the mass of this Higgs boson unfortunately was not predicted, but the rest is fixed. So the couplings of this Higgs boson to all the other particles in the standard model is fixed. Um, you see this here, you have interaction strengths and you have a, a, a coupling to fermions, which leads to the fermion mass, which is proportional to the mass of these fermions. So once there was a very nice article in the German newspaper, two pages long, and the title was uh, Particle Physicists Know Everything About This Particle. The only thing they don't know is whether it exists. And I think this is clearly true. Yeah? Once you know the mass, uh, the mass is to be measured in the experiment. Once you know the mass, everything is fixed. This is also which uh, puts us in a position to test then precisely the predictions of the standard model as soon as we have measured the mass. So this means we can also calculate then the production of this particle and also how it decays. And you all know the mass of the Higgs boson is around 125 GeV. And this here is a plot which shows the branching ratios, the decay of the Higgs particle as a function of its mass. The mass here at 125 GeV, you see you have a plethora of channels. You have a very, very, very rich decay scenario, which uh, Fabiola Janotti, when she gave the discovery talk in 2012, she said, this is uh, a present of nature because if it would be very heavy, you would have uh, only W and Z decays essentially. The rest would be very much suppressed. But here, the mass is such that you can really test decays into W and Z particles. A very rare case into two photons, which you see here, are very much down. 
with a branching ratio of 0.2%, even Z gamma decays at a level of 0.2%. And then as well, you can test the decays into fermions, into the meta particles. And if you look carefully here, you see the largest branching ratio is the Higgs boson decay into a pair of heavy quarks of the third generation into DB bar. But this decay is difficult to discover and was not among the discovery channels which were seen in 2012. So if you work out the decays and then you can predict as well the lifetime, you see here that the Higgs boson does not exist for long before it decays. The lifetime is at the level of 10 to the minus 22 seconds. You can express this as the uh, width of the particle, which is only 4 MeV. So it's really a very, very narrow resonance. So let me show you, I hope it works, a little um, animation about how you should figure out now the Higgs boson. So this is, um, if there would be no Higgs field, then all the particles would have no mass. They would propagate with the speed of light, having no mass. Now, all the particles, so the quarks, leptons, and even these are photons here, would move with the speed of light. In the Higgs concept, you fill the vacuum with a background field, which now comes into play. You see the blue dust coming in, and then, the particles start to interact with this background field. And you see that some of them, um, the interaction strength is much stronger and thereby they aggregate a higher mass. And at the same time, we can use this mechanism then at the LHC when protons collide to excite this Higgs field and to form an excited state, which we call the Higgs boson. This Higgs boson, as I just explained, will not live for long. And then it decays, for example, it decays into two photons. And if now you put your experiment around the beam pipe and you are able to detect these two photons, as it is done here in this nice event display from our colleagues of the CMS collaboration, you have, of course, particle identification. You realize pretty soon that you don't have a charge break. You have energy depositions in what is called the calorimeter. And then you can reconstruct from the energies and the directions, the invariant mass of this photon pair. Of course, having one such event doesn't make a discovery. You have to accumulate statistics and make sure that what you see is an excess of events at a certain mass above the background, which you expect from standard model processes. So this was exactly done in 2012. And these are the plots which I digged out from the original publications. This comes, goes back to the Higgs boson discovery in 2012. You see the Higgs boson was discovered in so-called bosonic decay modes, either in gamma gamma, you may ask the question later, why did you use gamma gamma? Because I showed you before the branching ratio is so lousy. Um, it was discovered in the case we are intermediate state of ZZ star going to four leptons. And it was discovered in the decay of WW star, again, decaying to two leptons and two neutrinos. So then you can reconstruct the four lepton invariant mass. And this is what you see. You see a little excess here. Likewise, you see an excess for the gamma gamma mass. And then here we have the problem that you have neutrinos and the neutrinos are difficult to detect. You cannot detect them in the longitudinal direction. So you can only reconstruct what we call a transverse mass. And this is this excess which you see here. So at the time of the discovery, we had to combine all these CK modes in order to claim discovery. This was done by both experiments, ATLAS and CMS. And here you see a plot where you see the probability that the excesses here, the combined excesses are due to fluctuations of backgrounds. And you see here that this is uh, at a level uh, which is uh, beyond five sigma, which is usually claimed uh, as uh, discovery significance. So I will, now show you later 
what we have learned over the past years. Before I do this, let me just uh, list again the open questions um, in particle physics. What are the next questions on our list of problems to address? So the question of the mass and the existence of the Higgs boson was the most important one before the discovery. But still today, we are not done with it because we have to check whether the Higgs boson has the predicted properties. And then we have to ask the question, why is it so light? Because it is as a fundamental scalar, it receives large quantum corrections to its mass. And um, some theorists don't like this. This is known as a naturalness or hierarchy problem. In principle, you would like to push the mass up to the Planck scale if there's no new physics coming into play. And then you may ask the question linked to this, is it a fundamental particle or is it a composite scalar? Because we don't have any other scalar of fundamental nature in the standard model. So a pi zero, for example, is a composite particle and it's a scalar particle. So it could be the same recipe with the Higgs. Then there's the question of unification. Why do we see these four forces? And is there a possibility, you know, all that the electroweak interaction is um, uh, take, taking place, unification of the weak and the electric magnetic force can we include the strong force at some gut scale and eventually can we also include uh, gravity. And then there's big questions concerning the structure and the composition of matter. Um, if you look at the energy density of the universe, you realize that the only thing we can explain by ordinary matter, by the standard fermions, uh, is um, about making up 4.9% of the energy density. The rest is what we think is dark in form of dark matter and dark energy with these compositions here. And you may ask the question, is this dark matter caused by supersymmetric particles? Um, again, why are there three fam families of fermions and what is the origin of the matter and the matter assumed? So these are all big questions which are not yet answered by the existence of the Higgs particle. Let me just touch on supersymmetry. Why was it or is it a favorite uh, theory? Um, there are important motivations, namely that supersymmetry provides a candidate for the dark matter, namely the lightest supersymmetric particle, which is in many models weakly interaction. It would leave um, the atlas detector and the CMS detectors without much grace. And it would also not be visible in the structures of the universe. Then there is the unification question of the couplings of the three interaction. Um, you know all that the interaction strength depends on the energy, on the energy scale. So you can predict what is the uh, convolution or the involvement of the energy of the couplings. And if you take the standard model, they will not meet. However, if you introduce supersymmetry, you change the running behavior, for example, at the scale of one TeV, and then, of course, you could achieve um, such a unification. And then finally, uh, I mentioned already these quadratically divergent quantum corrections. They would be nicely canceled in such a theory because you would have, uh, for each spin one uh, particle, you would have a spin zero partner and vice versa, and they would enter these corrections with a different sign. And if the masses are not too different, you would get automatically, by nature, a nice cancellation. So these are the questions. Now, where do we stand? What have you learned over the past 10 years? Let me first show you a plot which shows the total integrated uh, luminosity collected, in particular in the so-called run two at the LHC from 2016 to 2018. You see here the energies in these different periods and here you see the amount of integrated luminosity. So you see that we had really a fantastic uh, run two. And um, I think the combination of the performance of the LHC machine, the detectors and the grid computing have proven to be a terrific success story. So this is also nicely shown in these plots here. Uh, this is the plot I showed you before. We expose our decay into four leptons. We are in the immediate state to two Zs. And this is where we stand after run two. You see here now a very, very convincing peak. Uh, of course, it remained at the same mass of 125 GeV. Again, for the other decays in bosons, Higgs to gamma gamma. Also here you have now 
for example, in the CMS experiment, 1,500 counts here, clearly above background. If you subtract the background, this one I've shown you, and also after background subtraction, you have a fantastic signal uh, in the Atlas experiment for x 2 ww So there's no doubt uh, today that this X boson exists, and also discovery is there independently in each of these channels. Yeah? So very nice confirmation. Now you may ask, where are the permanents? Why is it so difficult to detect uh, the Higgs boson decays, for example, in DD bar? Despite the fact what I told you, that the branching ratio is very high, 57%. The problem is signal to background. Now, if you have a Higgs boson, which decays into BB bar, um, this, of course, gives you two B quark jets in the final state. But unfortunately, you get such B jet final states at a very, very high rate by processes from quantum chromodynamics. And they have a much, much larger cross section. So, for example, you can have a QQ bar annihilation via a gluon, and you have BB bars in the final state. And the ratio between this and this process is one to 10 million. So, this looks like looking for really a needle in a haystack. And that's why we had to use um, different accompanying signatures in order to get the signal out of the background. And such an accompanying signature is, for example, the associated production of a Higgs boson together with a Z boson at the same time. With the Higgs boson, you let it decay into BB bar, but then you ask for leptons for the Z boson decay. And leptons always give you a huge background rejection in a hadron collider environment. So you look for leptons or neutrinos or photons. So with this trick, it was possible by the experiments Atlas and CMS to reconstruct uh, the decays of the Higgs into tau tau. This was an observation which was published in 2016. Two years later, both experiments published the observation of Higgs to BB bar in 2018. And meanwhile, also we have in 2018 at the same year, this was, in my opinion, the highlight of the run two, the, the demo, demonstration of the fermionic, of the fermion couplings to the Higgs boson. At the same time, we have seen evidence or clear observation for the associated production of the Higgs boson with the TT bar pair. And this coupling here was proven, which is very, very important. So there is a clear observation of the couplings to the third generation permits. You may ask, can you go further? What about the second generation permions? Um, this is more difficult simply because I told you the Higgs coupling is proportional to mass. Uh, so the fermion, the muon mass is of course much lower than the tau mass or the deep quark mass. And thereby uh, we have a very challenging situation. You only have produced in the full data set only 2000 events produced on top of a huge background. And if you look at this plot here from the CMS collaboration, you basically see nothing except that it's flat. And then they had to uh, gain or improve the sensitivity through a separation of various production modes. They use neural networks and boosted decision tree discriminants in all of these categories, combine it, and then they got the three sigma evidence for the presence of this decay, which is some evidence that we call it, but not an observation yet. And um, the similar, like in Atlas, we had a similar signal strengths, uh, but the significance is at the level of 2.0 sigma. Uh, let me introduce here the signal strengths. This is shown here by this construction. It is putting the observed rate in relation to the standard model rate, what you expect in the standard model. If it is standard model like, you expect this new value to be one. Uh, and you see here the signal strength, which is observed in both experiments, is consistent with one, but the uncertainties are, of course, too large to claim observation. So, this is clearly what is written here. Um, first evidence is C, however, run three and beyond is essential to increase the sensitivity. So, what about the other X boson parameters? As I mentioned, the mass is an input parameter. What about its spin and CP? The standard model predicts zero spin and positive CP parity. The widths I mentioned is 4 MeV. The production and decay rates are given very directly by the standard model. 
And then finally, uh, the standard model also predicts that the Higgs boson should be self interacting uh, to itself. And this is really not yet tested, the last part. Let me show you in one summary slide how the first three points are tested. The mass is very precisely measured by both experiments, ATLAS and CMS. You see here, the uncertainties are already at the level of uh, one per million, 0.1%, which is very impressive. I think even theorists do not ask us for much higher pre precision here. Um, the spin is uh, shown to be compatible with zero plus. This was tested also right in the beginning in run one. Um, however, we cannot exclude that there are some uh, admixtures of CP odd contributions. They cannot be excluded. So now there was a long debate about the widths. I mean, normally you cannot measure directly the width of the exponent because it's so narrow. The experimental resolution is one to two TV. However, our theory uh, friends, I think Passarino was the first one, um, they worked out that we can calculate or extract the widths by measuring off shell production and comparing it to the production at the resonance. And this gives an amazing result published by the CMS collaboration, a width of 3.2 MeV, which is very consistent with the 4 MeV expected with these uncertainties here. I think this is an amazing result, albeit it is, of course, an indirect measurement. But you see already here, we have made quite some progress. Now, what about the cutting strengths? These are different production processes for the Higgs boson. Yeah, we are the gluon fusion, we are a top loop, vector boson scattering, and so on. And you can measure now the signal strengths in all the decay modes, which have been seen. And I showed them gamma, gamma, W, Z, B, tau, and so on. You combine everything and you extract the, the predicted weather, uh, over the measured rate. And you see that all these measurements, these new parameters are very consistent with one. Likewise, if you take the combinations for the new values in the different decay modes, so the branching ratios for X to, to gamma, gamma, Z, Z, and so on, also here, you measure numbers which are very consistent with one. So at the present level of measurement precision, we have no indication for any deviations from the standard model in the Higgs sector. I think this is nicely summarized in this block here. For most collaboration, I choose to call the CMS block because they have nice colors on here. <laughs> so what is shown here is as a function of the particle mass. So you have here the top quark, the W, the Z, then you have the, um, the B quark, the tau lepton, and even the muon. Um, you show the coupling strengths, which has, has some normalization factors to put this on a straight line. And you see here, this is what the standard model predicts. And these are the measurement points, and these are the ratios. And you see an excellent agreement with the standard model prediction. This, the coupling scaling over many orders of magnitude here is consistent with what is shown in the standard model. And this is a different type of interaction, if you like, because in the standard model, we are used to see, for example, universality in the lepton sector, which means that the tau should couple with the same strengths to the W or Z boson as, it, as a muon does. And this is clearly not seen, not confirmed for the Higgs. So in that sense, this is a new particle or a new coupling behavior has been established. So for experts, I put this slide on here, which um, goes a little bit further and assumes now that allows now for some deviations. So for the various coupling uh, to the various particles, you introduce a scaling factor, a kappa value, and you, load, you, you pick for this kappa value. As long as the standard model holds, this kappa value should be one. If you see deviations from these couplings in all your measurements, you put all your measurements together, and then you see that these kappa values for all the uh, fermions and the Z bosons are very, very consistent with one. If you make some mild theoretical assumptions, you can even constrain the branching ratio of the Higgs boson into unknown particles. And what you can extract is 
an upper limit of 9% that the Higgs boson decays into invisible particles, which is also quite amazing. Even if you don't see this space, because of constraints in your pit, you can extract uh, an upper limit of 9%. So there's not much room, of course, at the level of 10%, not much room for invisible decays. So about the Higgs cell boson coupling, let me be brief here. This is something which is not tested yet. This is still open. And for this, we need much more data. And this is uh, at the um, one of the highlights which we want to address in the upcoming run three and beyond. In order to test the Higgs self boson coupling, which means the coupling of the Higgs boson to itself, you would have to produce di Higgs, uh, so a pair of Higgs bosons. Unfortunately, you also can produce a pair of Higgs bosons via such processes which have nothing to do with the Higgs boson cell coupling. And the problem is that the di Higgs boson production is 1,000 times smaller than the Higgs boson production. And that's why this is not established yet. We have here some constraints from the two experiments, which um, constrain this kappa value, which should be one to the range which you see here. And you see the, the band, which is still open, is still pretty large. So this is something which is on our agenda for the next years. So uh, very often, if you give a particular public talk, um, the, the people ask, yes, you have to discover this, but what else have you done? And this is, of course, frustrating for us who have spent 10 years of hard work at the NHC. And my answer is very clear. This is the answer. Yeah, this is the answer. So this is an amazing plot. I mean, also it exists from Bose experiment that showed the Atlas plot. Here you have many, many different production processes, uh, jet production, gamma, WZ, TP bar, and so on, going down to very, very rare case, just to put some numbers up. Here you have 100 billion events produced of this type. And here you go down to something like 140 events in the total set, data set of objects and CMS. And then you compare this to the prediction of theory, which are these gray bands. Look, for example, at these bands here, or look at these bands here. Look at all these points. For all these processes, of all these orders of magnitude which you see here, there is no deviation. This is, in my opinion, a fantastic triumph of experiment and theory. The standard model provides a successful description of the data. And this is also um, uh, realized because of the huge progress uh, in the theory community uh, carrying out all these higher order calculations. I mean, all these processes, many of them are now at a position of so called next to next to leading order in quantum corrections, which means us this was due to a revolution in the theory field over the past uh, 10, 15 years. And this is also very hard calculations. That's why my theory colleague in Freiburg, Stefan Lindmeier, always says LHC stands for long and hard calculations. <laughs> so, is there physics beyond the standard model? We are, we are looking for this. And you see here, sometimes you see spectacular events, like that you have a lot of energy going into one direction of the experiment, and you see nothing on the other side. This is a perfect event for dark matter. Now, dark matter could be recoiling and escaping detection. But then you do the analysis, you work out your data as a function of the missing momentum, which you see here. And then you see that the data can be extremely well explained by a cocktail of standard model processes. Because also in the standard model, you have processes which give you large missing transverse energy. Think, for example, about the production of a Z boson together with a jet, where the Z boson decays into neutrinos. Yeah? So, unfortunately, no evidence for this. And this um, um, can then be summarized, for example, in limits for supersymmetric particles. I don't want to discuss this in detail. You should just take home that we have excluded supersymmetric particles at the scale of two TV terra electron mole for partners of quarks and gluons who are strongly interacting. The, the, the top partners are special, and here the limits are at 1.25 TV. So there's no hint for supersymmetry at this mass scale. Let me now move to the future. 
So I mentioned already run three. You see here the timeline of the LHC. We have done run one with the discovery at these energies. Then we went up to 13 TV in run two. And right now in 22, and we are about to start in 23 at an increased energy of 13.6 TV. And we will run until the end of 2025. And we hope at least to double the luminosity as we have, as we have it today. And then we will go into the high luminosity LHC phase starting in 2029 after this break here where we install the large upgrades. And then we plan to accumulate something like 3000 inverse femtobahn in total, which uh, tells you if you compare to what we have today, uh, that we still are at the very beginning. We have only accumulated so far 5% of the final data. But unfortunately, we cannot increase the energy, which would be nice to do. This is limited by the magnet strengths of the LHC. So we will carry out precise measurements of differential Higgs, cross, uh, Higgs boson cross section. This will then end up in effective field theory analysis. Uh, of course, we will reach sensitivity to the Higgs boson cell coupling. We will not precisely measure it, but we will get first glimpse, a glimpse at it. And we can explore the Higgs boson as a portal to new physics. We are invisible decays. I touched already on this. And in particular, we can extend the searches for new physics, where we focus now on more exotic scenarios, like, for example, weak couplings and thereby long-lived particles. So um, towards the long-term future. As you saw, the properties of the Higgs boson agree very well with the center model expectations. There's no evidence for supersymmetry or other BSM physics found yet. No new particles. However, I personally think, and I hope that this is shared by all scientists, this is a huge scientific achievement. We now know that there is no low scale supersymmetry in the form as it was predicted and expected by some theorists. And there's no sign of dark matter at the LHC yet. Despite this, new physics is required for the questions I raised at the very beginning, but there's no clear indication of the energy scale. So these results together, in my opinion, have led to a paradigm change. Before the LHC started, the in this plane here, coupling versus energy, the idea was to move up to higher and higher energy. And now the focus has still here, but in addition, there is a second focus, namely on the intensity frontier. The focus has moved towards uh, looking for weaker couplings and search for example, for people interacting particles, neutral heavy leptons, or as you know, there were up to some time and still are some flavor anomalies. However, in this plane here, and in general, I think it's fair to say that there is no strong guidance from theory. Now, the Higgs was a very clear predicted particle with all the properties predicted. This is not the case anymore for physics beyond the standard model. So we are back in a situation. Uh, you see here a third series from Ellis producing many, many ideas, many, many papers. I think we are somewhat back to this situation, and experiment must show the way. And this is why we need to work and uh, think about the future of constructing a new powerful particle accelerator beyond the LHC. Let me say that the understanding of the Higgs sector is vital. It is the least tested sector. Um, it is profoundly different from the elementary particles discovered so far as explained, the only spin zero particle, and it's um, related to the most obscure sector of the standard model. This was nicely uh, formulated by John Judicher, the CERN theorist, saying that every problem of the standard model originates from the Higgs interactions. So clearly, the Higgs has to be understood. It provides a unique door into new physics and calls for a very broad and challenging experimental program. Let me just summarize a bit here. Um, we need to measure with high precision decouplings better than we know them today. And as many generations as possible, including the second generation and hopefully as well at some point the first generation, 
The Higgs boson cell coupling needs to be understood and measured because it's responsible for the shape of the potential. And then we have to look for forbidden or rare decays, like for example, does the Higgs decay to tau mu, which would tell us something about the flavor structure and sources of thermal masses. Um, other Higgs boson properties like the CPA mixture, a probe of compositeness and the search for additional Higgs bosons. So what is the precision that you need? Um, it, this depends, of course, on the energy scale of the new physics. Here are some examples for the energy scale of new physics around 1 TeV. And depending on your physics model, you see here that you expect deviations uh, at the order of a few percent. So clearly, we have to come to the percent level. High precision is vital to reach larger energy scales. And only with the high luminosity LHC, we will be able to approach the percent level sensitivity. If you want to go beyond, then you need a new collider. On the search for new physics, search for dark matter. The detection is, of course, a great challenge. And here, in order to reliably pin down its nature, we need the interplay between different experiments, like, for example, a direct detection of um, dark matter particles impacting on nuclei uh, on Earth, or you have the annihilation process, for example, that dark matter annihilates in electrons, uh, antiprotons, and so on. There are experiments in space, and then you have the LHC. In other words, you have a diagram which you can turn around in different directions, and the experiments have to be, give you a consistent picture in order to nail down, pin down the dark matter. So this brings me to the um, question, what can future particle physics experiment contribute? As mentioned, we are still largely ignorant about the nature of dark matter. There are standard cosmological models which give you viable masses of the dark matter over a huge range. They can be in the range starting of KEV, so-called axion-like particles, uh, up to 100 TeV. In addition, uh, we have to be open for a broad range of scenarios. There could be the wind-type dark matter. There could be mediator models, which are quite popular now, that there is a portal between a dark sector or a hidden sector and our standard model world. The Higgs could play maybe a portal in such, such models here. And therefore, we have to complement these high energy scenarios by dedicated experiments searching for light, dark matter, and feebly interactive particles. And this is also what you see today, what is going on to be set up at CERN. So this is um, a, then a summary of how the different areas of particle physics can contribute. I think we need particle colliders, direct and indirect dark matter detection, neutrino experiments, cosmic surveys, and measurement of rare processes, and so on. You can see here where the sensitivity lies. And uh, particle high energy particle colliders are still unique in the sense that they can, the only ones who can cover the Higgs particle, and we need precision and energy. To summarize, the scientific diversity and the combination of complementary approaches are crucial to explore directly and indirectly the largest range of energy scales and couplings and to properly interpret science of new physics to reach the goal to build a coherent picture of the underlying theory. And this calls as well for a global coordination of these efforts. So let me use the last minutes of my talk to bring you up to date. What is the strategy and what are the plans in Europe? This was summarized in a 2020 update of the European strategy for particle physics. And here under the label of high priority future initiatives, the statement is that an electron positron X factory is the highest priority next collider. For the longer term, the European particle physics community has the ambition to operate a proton-proton collider at the highest achievable energy. In order to operate a proton-proton collider, you have still to do a lot of accelerator R and D. 
And this is stressed here. The particle physics community should ramp up the R&D effort focused on advanced accelerator technologies, in particular that on high field superconducting magnets, including high temperature superconductors. The LHC, I mentioned the energy is limited by the power or the strengths of the bending power of the magnets. We are at 8.3 Tesla, and at a given radius, you can reach 14 TV. If you want to go to 100 TV, you need a larger ring and or stronger magnets. The idea is to build stronger magnets, which can go up to a field strength of 14, 15, 16 Tesla, double, and a larger ring. And for this, you need stronger superconductors, uh, even thinking about high temperature superconductors, this would be beneficial also concerning the power consumption. The power of the LHC does not go into the acceleration. The power, the largest power bill goes into the cooling because this accelerator is uh, operating at a temperature of liquid helium at minus 271 degrees centigrade. If you would have high temperature superconductors, of course, your energy bill would be much, much uh, low. So, but the first focus should be on the plus and minus. And you may know that there are several initiatives to build them as linear colliders. There is a proposal in Japan to build the International Linear Collider. Uh, as well, CERN has developed a concept which is called click concept, which is a straight line here. Then there's the concept of circular colliders, as you are used to it from the times of LEP. LEP, a large ring, is 27 kilometers, which we're using today, was operated in the 1990s with electrons, and then it was replaced by the LHC, um, putting in protons, bringing much higher energies. And this concept was quite successful. And this idea is followed up again, uh, both at CERN and also in China. China has as well the ambition to build uh, such a large ring to fill it with electrons initially and then go to a proton collider later. So what are the advantages of circular and linear colliders? So in a circular collider, you would have huge luminosities at low energy. For example, if you would run the um, FCC, as you saw it on the previous scale, at the resonance of the Z boson, you would get a huge luminosity. Uh, here are impressive numbers. Uh, LEP in the history of 10 years accumulated something like four times 10 to the six Z0 bosons. And you would go to a number of 10 to the 12 Z0 bosons, which would allow you to very precisely test predictions of the standard model in the Z. But not only the Z, you could also go up um, to um, WW pairs and so on. So they have less luminosity, however, at higher energies, which is linked to the large circulatory radiation, which is the problem of putting electrons on the circular orbit. Um, the linear colliders would be fantastic machines at the energy frontier. The luminosity would even increase here and you could reach with a linear collider, extending the length of the collider, one TV or three TV in click collisions. So what would it mean in terms of precision for Higgs? Here you see a table where I show again these kappa values, and this would be the precision which you would achieve at the ILC running at 250 GV or at the FCC EE running at 240 GV. You see here, these numbers are in first instance, quite comparable. And then there are some star numbers here, which are couplings, for example, to the top quark or to the muon, which are still not at a fantastic precision. And the fantastic precision you would only get if you would complement this electro machine at a later stage with a hydro machine. And then you clearly see that you would be very well below the 1% line. In addition, what concerns the self coupling parameter, also here, the ultimate precision would come from the FCC HH. So what is the potential of such a powerful collider? Uh, let, me, let me cut this story short. Um, the Hadron Collider would, of course, be the most powerful machine to look for 
extensions of supersymmetry in higher energies. So you would reach squawk masses at the level of 70, 20 TeV. And um, clearly the mass range above 10 TeV would be accessible. On the dark matter search, there would be as well a nice complementarity in this scattering plane here of cross-section versus mass, where you would have the direct detection experiments and the low mass would be very nicely covered at these future colliders. So let me just summarize where we stand with the planning. Um, in the strategy, it was said that CERN should explore the feasibility for such an integrated electron patron program at CERN. You see here the plan is to build a circular collider with a circumference of around 100 kilometers. There is a so-called feasibility study, which is ongoing. This was approved by the CERN Council, which is the highest uh, decision-making body on particle physics in Europe in June 21. The report is about to be released by the end of 2025 and will present the basis for a decision for the next collider at the next strategy meeting, which comes about in 2026, 2027. And there's a mid-term report expected already at the end of this year. So these are the deliverables addressed to understand the realization of the geology infrastructure the political realization. And right now, uh, you see here that this has converged already at a so-called low risk placement in the Basin of Geneva and French area here with a circumference of 91 kilometers. But then you address as well um, the cost has to be financed and so on. And then for the upper collider, you have to address the techno technological challenges of 16 TV superconducting magnets, as I mentioned. This is not trivial, and this requires a huge program on accelerator R&D. And you do not want to put all your eggs in one basket. Um, there is a lot going on on the high field magnets and high temperature superconductors. But at the same time, the accelerator community is also looking into more innovative acceleration techniques like acceleration with plasma wave fields or laser wave fields, or with uh, building a so called muon collider producing bright muon beams, and is also working on energy recovery dynamics. So, this brings me to the end. I hope that I have shown you that the LHC experiments have made tremendous progress in the exploration of the nature of the Higgs particle. I mean, all is summarized by this plot here. However, many key questions of particle physics remain open. Uh, the need to look for new theoretical paradigms makes today's research in particle physics very exciting, rich with opportunities for alternative and revolutionary ideas, also in particular from the theory side. And the high energy colliders will continue to play a key role. The focus must be on precision and the exploration of the high energy territory. And such accelerators are unique to explore in more depth the Higgs particle, which may give guide us to the answers of the fundamental questions mentioned before. Thank you very much. Very much, very, very nice talk. So, questions now. Firstly, from the clinic, if there is any question, because then students will play a lonely card in the room. <laughs> Just one very short question. I mean, when you say there are no 16 Tesla magnets, you mean of high temperature superconductors, or the volume is so high that it's hard to make? <clears throat> the technology is not ready yet to build 16 Tesla magnets today. Uh, not even with the more conventional uh, low temperature superconductors. What is um, followed up at CERN? And in other European labs is to take um, niobium sheet tin as a superconductor. Um, 
I think there are quite there, there are some successes that have reached 11, 12 Tesla fields, <clears throat> but the mass production is another issue. You know, it's not enough to build one or two magnets which then work in, in a lab. You have to produce them here. You see on the scale thinning uh, 100 kilometer time. Yeah, so there is some other uh, skill. I'm not saying it's not going to be successful, but it still requires a lot of work. That's a problem. I mean, this this valuable street thing material seems to be uh, not easily handleable. It seems to be very brittle, and it's very sensitive to stress and so on. And the problem. So, the problem is a reproducible of uh, these magnets. Okay. Okay. On, 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 on uh, yeah, that's right. Okay. Yeah. So I think your help is very much appreciated. <laughs> and also here in Italy, um, a lot of work is ongoing. It's in Milano, close to here. Yeah. Lucio, Lucio Rossi is working on this, also towards the high temperature magnets. And then you know very well, Italy is also a big fan of the muon collider. Colleagues are helping me, but yeah. Other questions? Maybe. Uh, you was very, I mean, let's say, polite when you explained uh, the difference between a linear collider and a circular collider. One thing that maybe, I mean, uh, I think it's clear, it's clear to me is that FCTE will can be done already now with the current technology. So maybe this could be the, the, the mainstream, the main direction. Maybe there are no, I mean, outcome in other, in other evolution for other, for other stuff, but technically we can do it already now. And yeah. I'm super happy. Yeah, I think, I think uh, <clears throat> you are right, uh, but the same applies as well to ILC. Mm -hmm. you know, ILC, uh, you know, uh, was a world collaboration over many years of R&D. I think this collider could be built as well. Yeah. Um, but you are right on the uh, circular in plus and minus and CERN. If you would take the political decision to build this ring, this tunnel, you would know how to install any plus and minus nothing. You could still optimize it uh, with RF technology and so on. But in principle, the problems are not at the nature of the accelerator, unlike for the atom version. No. This is why it probably cannot jump directly now to the hadron collider. Yeah. Yeah. Because of these problems of the magnets. Julio, what are you doing now? Uh, Okay, if there are no more questions, we start the experiment. Uh, so all the faculty is out. Uh, and uh, you will be locking in the room with the military to do it, Okay. <laughs> 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 Okay, have fun. Okay. okay, yeah. So, I mean, this is a study I'm trying to do experiments <laughs> because I thought uh, that people is in five. Yeah. So, um, we have a problem, maybe you know it. Um, after such a talk, some seniors ask questions, and the students sometimes say, Ah, I. I, I, I'm too far. I don't dare to ask this stupid question. And then most of these questions are not stupid at all. No? So we decided to kick the faculty out and, <laughs> and, and then we the student in the room and the speaker. And this works very well because the feedback is always from both sides from the speaker. They take a lot of questions from the students, and the students uh, are happy to ask their questions. So please, do you feel free? 
and uh, I have time to answer them. Yeah, but if you want to stop after 10 minutes or 15 minutes, it's up to you. So, you had a question. Yes, uh, okay. thank you very much for your talk today. It was really interesting. Uh, so, you want to build a lot, but the NFC NH wants to build a lot. And right now, geopolitically, it's a very unstable time. Has the recent year of the war and the kind of general economic instability affected the plans of building these things? Or right now, has it kind of uh, not affected? I think it's a very good question. So, um, the world climate is not in our favor. Yeah, very clear. But this is not the problem of public things. It's uh, affecting all sides because money gets more and more scarce. Yeah. Um, you have seen there are some regulation that turn concerning the cooperation with Russia. Yeah. So the agreement with Russia will, if it's if the, the war is not finding a solution soon, it's not going to end. Will not be renewed. Which means that our Russian colleagues have to meet the experiment that CERN at the uh, uh, latest after 2024. So, in that sense, we lose already, you know, colleagues, we lose work, workforce to the experiment and so on. Um, of course, um, there is um, uh, no direct implication yet measurable for the future colliders because they are not approved. So the financing is not worked out. I mean, we have to wait for the next strategy in 26, 27. But of course, if it continues like this, we will not be able to get contributions from Russia. Um, China is not clear because you saw they have their own ideas. I think there is a direct competition between China and Europe on this future colonies. And I take this very serious. Yeah, they have learned a lot about they have catch up, caught up a lot over the past decades. And I think they would be capable to build as well an E plus e minus collider in China. And if you ask me, um, what is the difference? The difference is in China, you have to convince two important people in the government and you get the money. And in Europe, you have to convince 20 governments for 20 years. And now you chat for this moment. <laughs> so I, I think you know it is it is impacting us. I mean also the world climate between US, China, and so on. Yeah. 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 You mentioned that uh, in order to look for new physics, uh, we have to look uh, at higher energies or lower weaker properties. And you said that LHC brought a uh, change of paradigm in uh, this respect. Uh, why? What's uh, the point in LHC that uh, convinced you to shift the uh, focus? So, um, <clears throat> if if you you would have made uh, a, an interview with physicists or a, a, a survey with physicists in two thousand and nine. And you would have asked them, what is the LHC going to discover? Most of them would have said supersymmetric particle. I mean, there were predictions. You switch on the LHC and you will, you will see them immediately. The Higgs boson was expected, Higgs boson was expected to come far huh? more difficult. And the reason is because it is so nuts. Now, you have dark matter, you can explain dark matter. You would explain the coupling interaction unification. And you would explain that the Higgs boson is so light naturally. Now, because you have fermions and partners, and they would, the contributions would cancel. Supersymmetry looks like a fantastic scenario. Now, but then you look at the experiment and it doesn't show up. Okay? Now, the big difference between the Higgs particle and supersymmetry is the following. The Higgs particle, you know, we have a clear prediction. Uh, the mass must be between zero and one TV. And then you should find it or you rule it out. Yeah? And, and so if you find it, you can test the coupling and so on. On supersymmetry, we have no clue. Yeah? The mass scale is not known at all. So 
Uh, if the mass scale is one TeV or two TeV, then you reach this, but this we haven't seen because we, we are at two, two TeV today. Now, of course, you can say, yes, there may be more complicated scenarios and so on. So maybe some people now think going in the high energy direction only is not enough. Yeah? We must as well be more general and look uh, at weaker masses, lower masses and weaker couples. They could explain as well dark matter. These are these axial particles. Now, if you had enough of them, you would also explain the dark matter in the universe. This is why the paradigm change came about. Now, um, theories get less and less convincing to sell a supersymmetry. <laughs> now, now you say, okay, we have no guidance. We have to look as well in other directions for TV like particles. This is what, what is here. Yeah, we have no guidance for you. It's the type of experiments, and this is why, in my opinion, we must do the next step to build the next slide. I want to put what is there. There's a, the list of questions is long, actually, but we cannot explain. Okay. More questions? Please. Uh, this question you already pointed that uh, the jumping ratio for these gamma gamma is lower, but still, if this channel is uh, one of the closing channels for the Higgs discovery, uh, may I ask why? Yes, good question. So, um, I, I mean, here, this I, I try to explain <clears throat> if you would look for Higgs decays to Bs. Yeah, then this is the signal, and this is the background. The background, of course, at the LHC comes from because at the LHC you have protons on proton collisions. The proton itself is made up of quarks and gluons. So these are strongly interacting particles. So everything what is strongly interacting um, gives you, in the end, jets in the detector. So this is why it's so difficult to detect these things. And if you look now. What, are, what were the discovery channels? Discovery channels did not have any jets, any quarks in the final set. Now, for example, here, you deliberately choose four leptons. Here, you choose two leptons and missing energy because a lepton uh, is not in the initial state of the energy. Now, the initial state is protons made of quarks and gluons. So whenever you see a lepton at the LHC with a higher energy, this must come from some interesting decay of a heavy particle. Okay, so this is a question of selecting interesting events out of this huge rate of QCD process. So it works for leptons, obviously, it's a very clean channel. It works for leptons in combination with neutrinos, see here, and then it works also for photons. Yeah, so despite the crunch rate being so low. Yeah, 500 times lower than BBA. We saw this already in 2012, but we did not see BBA index. This is the reason. Yeah, the signal to background, and you look for, for signatures in the final set which are not there in the initial state. Uh, thank you for the report. And um, you mentioned that there are other designs that uh, you are studying for the accelerator as a linear design. And uh, I was wondering that why they are back in, uh, in the game since they you were at least with this uh, high energy accelerator where I, I thought that they were abandoned a few years ago and now the, this design is, uh, has been proposed. So I think they were not abandoned. Yeah, the, the problem the problem you see immediately, uh, we do the particle acceleration with RFPs. Yeah. Okay. So then you get a certain um, field gradient, electric electromagnetic fields. You get a certain field gradient. You are at something like um, uh, thirty-five uh, giga electron volt per meter, for example. Yeah. This is, if you want to build a linear collider today, that's state of the art. You do not easily get higher fields with conventional RF chemicals, which we are still using today. Yeah, we use them for electrons and for, for protons. So since 
you cannot work on, you cannot improve much these uh, RF fields, field strengths. You have to think about maybe more conventional, more, more exotic uh, acceleration scenarios, which reduce the length of your colliders. And if you do plasma acceleration, then you create very, very strong electromagnetic fields in a plasma. Uh, you get much, much higher heat strengths. Of course, you could build a collider with a few hundred meters. Uh, this would be a dream. But the, the research and development is not there yet uh, because you cannot build today. You can accelerate electrons in a plasma or photons in a plasma. This has been done at Daisy, Hamburg. Rascati is working on this, um, uh, but you do not get this for high intensities of particle beams. Okay, so there, there is the direction we, are, we have to do R&D. But in my opinion, this will take 30, 40, 50 years before you have, have a result. And if you do not want to stop uh, experimental investigation in particle physics, then you have to build the next collider still in a conventional form. I am personally convinced that the next one has to be a standard one. The size is big, as you saw. But after this, I hope that there is a breakthrough either on the muon collider side or on the bus. Italy is uh, interested in, in both. <laughs> so, in everything. In uh, Milano, they do the high temperature magnets. In Pascati, they do plasma and muons. Uh, uh, I don't know exactly where they do muons. But there's a lot of muon activity in Torino. Nadia Pastorone is working on this. I think Pascati is. Yeah. Okay, you're exhausted. Another question in the same direction. You said that uh, from the technical point of view, FCC even uh, a circular collider is much more uh, convenient at that moment. Yes. But what about the uh, detector requirements? Because for FCC even the luminosity will be much more higher than uh, than LHC. So, what about what's the status of the detector requirements? So, good question. Um, there is, a, first of all, there's a big, big difference between the detector requirements for an electron collider and the Hubble. Mm -hmm. yeah? Electron collider and lab. <laughs> this was easy. You know, at, at an electron collider and lab, um, the bunches were such that if the bunches were meeting, there was not always an interesting collision, not always the plus and minus reaction. At LHC, when the bunches meet with a high luminosity, you always get 40, 50, 60 events at the same time, what we call pipe. Yeah? So you have much more background, much more training in situation in the Hutton Collider. So I think the, the even if the luminosity at the FCC is a factor of 100 uh, higher than at left, the experiments are straightforward to be built, straightforward in quotes, because you always want to improve on the precision, you want to get them more precise. So, um, but in principle, I think they could be built with present technologies improved a bit here and there. Different if you want to have a detector for the FCC HH, because the pilot of FCC HH will not be at the level of 40, 50 events, it will be at 1,000 events. Now, they are, there you have huge requirements. And this is also why today in ECFA, the European Committee for Future Accelerators, we have to develop a roadmap for detector R&D development over the next 30 years. Okay, so you determine when this is uh, at the end. Well, one, one, one. The last question for me. Uh, so you have three open questions. Uh, I think it was a start. Which one would you like to see solved first and why? I would like to see solved the question of the dark matter. Why? Because if you see this plot, this uh, energy density of the universe, and you are a scientist doing fundamental science who wants to explain you know, the universe at some stage, and you realize that the only thing you can explain is 5% of that is there, this is wrong. Yeah. And the dark matter is with us since so long. I think it has to be it has to be solved. And I hope that I can see the solution for it. Okay, 
always fascinated me the dark. I mean, first the Higgs fascinated me, of course, and then the dark. But the others, I mean, I'm not afraid I have. So LHCP is, of course, very important experiments. They, they look at this details of the flavor. This is interesting, but I personally, my heart is more than I But everybody's personal thoughts. I'm not saying the other questions are oh, good. They're all important. Yeah? Um, about this question, uh, I mean, uh, something that bothered me a lot it, it is also uh, mass here, here at least masses in general, because as far as I know, there's no clue on how to explain why, for example, bosons have those masses and why they are, if there's this here at this world, is there any hope or any clue on uh, where to watch? I think I think you're right. I mean, even sometimes you read <clears throat> with the Higgs, they explain the mass. I think it's not true. Yeah, we have explained um, you know a mechanism how mass comes into the game, but for example, these Yukawa cardinals mm -hmm. proportional to mass, they are all introduced by hand and they are not explained. I think I don't have an answer to your question. I think this is a deep, theoretical question. And I hope that with some future insights from the experiments, here we will be able to, uh, to approach this at some point. But you're right, it's a good question. We have not solved, we cannot explain why the electron is um, so much lighter than the muon, 200 times lighter than the muon. No idea. Yeah, it's introduced by hand. But, but it works. I mean, the, the, as you saw, I mean, the straight line proves that the, the Kawak couplings are part of this Higgs software. Many, many theorists uh, thought that the Higgs mechanism would be nice, but would not come out like this in the experiment because they thought it's too naive. But it seems that this simple, naive idea introducing this state of deep works. And what is behind? We don't know. Okay. You're all PhD students? Good. Mm -hmm. Someone looking for a postdoc? I had a postdoc. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Maybe we can stop here. No? I hope, I hope that the talk was okay. Yes, no? Good. Thank you. Oh, so also a good question i think um, we are using a lot of machine learning techniques these days yeah. nearly many analyses you saw are, are based on machine learning yeah. On the uh, different things, neural networks, and so on. And this is now established, I would say. Yeah. Yeah. Many, there's nearly no analysis where this is not used. And you always improve by 20, 30 percent in the significance. But on quantum sensors, we have not yet started. Yeah. Because I think, yeah, it's it's not obvious um, how it can be used, and it needs a lot of development. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, probably it's just a theoretical, very yeah. theoretical question because typically the particle in preparing a Gaussian state. Yes. Yeah. So it's human. They squeeze them in a way that can. But it, it, yeah. I think it's very difficult. It's very difficult. Yeah. yeah but but machine learning is a step. Yeah. 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 Okay. I, I took a course in general in the group of work. Uh, 
Oh, tabii ki para var dedi ben. Yeah, şu an yes. They are very skilled and machine learning <laughs> technology. Jet classification problem was very hard. <laughs> There are a lot of things inside. So. Indeed. Okay. Yeah. okay. Thank you very much. Bye You're welcome. Bye. Bye. <laughs>